a KQED television production. such a good musician. Don't listen to them. Play. I mean, go, go. Make, make that direction really compelling. Also, make sure we hear the second note. You have to think like a singer. And, and I don't hear the syllable there, so I'm not sure what you're saying. It's don't think, of, don't think of the, rest, the quarter note rest as a stopping point. It's just a chance for you to catch the breath you know, for the next is, phrase. This, is, we'll this music it. is an emergency. You know, you're, you're, you're going to the hospital. You're going to the emergency <laughs> room. You've got to get there. Don't, don't wait for ba 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 Just go. <laughs> Coming into contact with people is one of the best excuses I can think of for teaching when we're traveling. It's a form of community engagement or community outreach. It's, it's also a way of making sure that you left something behind. It's a way to continue this process of, of sharing the wealth and modifying and shifting perspective. Mark, Mark, go, keep on, follow me, here, here, yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, teaching was a gift. I mean, these were extraordinary musicians, technically very, very accomplished, but good, 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 good. Not with the international perspective that we were in a position to share. How can you get a, a different color in your sound when you finally come to the second theme? Because to me, this is the relief <laughs> of our anxiety, you know? So really, I, it, it's beautiful. In the beginning, I wanted to play that music. And so I was kind of willing to do almost anything to allow the quartet to have a chance to survive. It's tender and it's quiet, but it's, it's all about warm heart, you See know? If you can condense the bow a little bit. We would visit elementary schools and do a little kind of lively shtick for the kids and, you know, play some of our repertoire, but you can never go more than a couple of minutes, you know, before the kids would get antsy. And it seemed crazy because at the same time I was playing at the Metropolitan Opera. Great operas with the biggest name singers in the world, fantastic plays, well-paid benefits. And I was choosing to go up to Connecticut and play for chill little children in an elementary school instead of playing at the Met because this was gonna give me a chance to play quartets. There are pros and cons to almost every job. Um, and I just sort of every day I pick up the violin and I say, wow, I mean, this is my office. This is kind of cool. What's the definition of, of, of a string quartet? And it's like, well, it's a, comprised of one good violinist. One bad violinist. And one former violinist. And one who hates violinists. I, my tongue's in my cheek, of course. I, I love my colleagues, but, but you know, it, going to work with the same people every day, <laughs> it's, it's challenging too.
know, we rehearse every day, five days a week, usually for not less than three hours and sometimes more. In terms of the effort that's there, you get a certain amount with not a great deal of effort after playing together for so long, and then that those small gradations of improvements in the rehearsals take a lot of effort, a lot of patience. Most of those rehearsals are organized primarily by Zach. I was a fan of the quartet before I was in the quartet. And I had a relationship with the quartet as a student. And I'm wrapping up my 13th season with the quartet now. Don't, don't play more real. Yeah, the sounds. It sounds when you start playing shakily. Well, exactly. It starts. I think it needs to sound not so shakily. Direction, but if you play, if you or play too, too if you play too, too slow, that's all. Well, I, I mean, I'll play whatever tempo you you start in. Just do well. I'm just telling you. Let's start in the answer. Let's start in the answer. You're not listening to what I'm saying, which is. It's a pretty amazing thing, actually, that you work so much together with the same people that you feel that you have a collective identity and a collective voice, not just the sum total of the four voices, but really something that becomes one thing. And when we're at our best, I think we achieve that. It's the most beautiful thing at, for me as a musician to have that relationship that provides the opportunity to make music on, a high, on the highest level. I, I could be very fulfilled professionally just doing that. I don't, you know, that's... That's great. My mom worked for San Francisco State for 25 years. And when I was about three and a half or four years old, she brought me to the Creative Arts Building and took me over to the band room. And they were having a group violin class. And I saw a bunch of kids playing the violin. And I thought it was a big play date and she asked me if I wanted to play violin and I didn't really know what that meant at that at that time and she's like do you want to do what what these kids are doing and I said sure what inspires me to teach is that I really want other people to carry on what I have devoted myself to over all these years I'm channeling the people that taught me and passing along some kind of holy information. This is an art form that I believe um, is very fragile. Why play so many dead composers? You know, there's, there's so many modern contemporary composers whose work is really going unnoticed and unplayed. And it was actually Paul who responded. He said, well, what if we forget how to play Mozart? Francis, he's a, an amazing guy. I always describe him as looking a lot like the classic Jeff Goldblum. We'll see what everybody thinks. We had years ago, our old first violinist, many years ago, had borrowed a very rare violin and we were on a train in Italy going to um, Rome, or go, no, we were, I think we were going north to Trento, and we mm -hmm. had to switch trains. He left the violin on the train, it was on a track over there. Oh, wow. And he suddenly realized his violin wasn't with him. We were on the other train. He got out, he went around, he jumped across the tracks, jumped <laughs> up, ran across another track, got the violin out of that train just as it started to move, jumped off just as the doors closed. Then we just started moving. 
and he ran around, jump, 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 jumped on the train. And he made it just before the doors shut. deal but I'm probably the only one that can hear it without just popping the whole thing down looser I'm gonna make it looser but I'm gonna bring it closer to the bridge a little bit he also did a little something with the string on the the nut you find some groove just to make sure that the D string can pass without resistance now the string length is a little longer. A little longer. So if so you, you pulled the bridge back to uh, no, because not, he, not as far. He had pushed the bridge forward to right. loosen it up. So you brought it back to where it was. More or less. Yeah. 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 Okay. This violin is part of that smart, marvelous set we've been playing for years, um, and it's on loan to us. And Sandy and Paul and I all have a violin or an instrument by the same maker. Each fiddle has a different sound. Even if it's the same model by the same maker, every piece of wood is different. I do work alone. I've done it all my career. After you're spending a few hundred hours making a cello or something like that, well, then to hang around and hear it being played and uh, get along with the player, and it's, much, it's pretty complete, man. You need an adjustment? Nope. Uh, it's a prostate <laughs> adjustment, but I don't uh, think you're that's where, that's where I don't think is. you're qualified to do that. Oh, he does have a special tool. It looks I like a medieval tool. Yeah. Maybe it's from the Spanish Inquisition or something. I mean, like it's that. what they use, something like that. You know, we're just one big happy family. Why are you walking like this? We need separate, we need separate <laughs> buildings when we can all live right next door to each other. This is great. Well, time to rehearse, right? Yes. Good. The master class in Gdansk with that group from the conservatory, that was quite interesting to me. I liked that energy in there, you know, you could sense that there was a certain nervousness and pride in what they were doing to play for the Alexander Quartet. Start the ball, for example, do the change there. Just, just so that you, it's, it seems like you get to the lower half of the bow and you're running out. Okay. And I think it would also make your voice a little bit clearer when you first come in. So they're connected, it's not a whole, but we're not sure. We're still thinking about it, so. So, I, I, I don't know if anyone else agrees with me. They probably don't. Usually they don't. But um, if you, I think you could even be a little bit more in the very, in your entrance and, and keep your sound up a little more. I mean, don't go up too much, but just so that it's still even, equal. <laughs> so can you try for the beginning again? And I, I mean, so whether you use vibrato or not, but. Make sure those little things come out. When I'm listening to a chamber ensemble or a string quartet, I'm listening for what can I do or say or suggest that will help them convey their ideas better. Teaching keeps me honest. I find myself 
having to explain something. And then once I have explained something, I, I kind of reflect on myself. And I think, do I actually do that when I play? It forces me to think about technique or musicianship in, in a way to explain this to somebody else. And that's a, cha that's a challenge for me. There are sacrifices, and sometimes you kind of wish you wouldn't have had to make those sacrifices, but I don't know whether if I were faced with the same decisions again, if I wouldn't just do the same thing. Since we were always the entrepreneurs as well as the artists, we were always the, the employers as well as the employees, we didn't, we didn't give ourselves that many breaks. I mean, we were pretty demanding on each, ourselves and each other. There are times when all four of us have been in a hotel restaurant and there's only four people in the restaurants, the four of us, and each one of us is at a different table. Not because we hate each other, but just because everybody just needs a few minutes to just to read a book and be by themselves. There's four individuals, but there's also that fifth entity, which is the quartet itself, presenting its collective idea. And that's always being refined. Five before, 28. And there are times Our work lies in itself. trying to refine that in such a way that when we do present it for an audience, <laughs> they can perceive that. You've got two people playing it one way, and then you're playing it completely different. It's not completely different. It is completely different. I asked you why you're playing it off the string, and then you say, oh, I want to do it this way. I, I just want to Fine, I don't want to be different. I don't want well, to whistle. Listen, you should ask so. them to... I'm not saying to play it like that. I'm just saying to match. I think a lot of where our arguments arise from is like, I don't think that that message is getting across because you're not loud enough or the articulation is too soggy. The underlying current that's constant is the uh, interpretive concept that we're trying to present. Is that being conveyed? No matter how much you love the repertoire, it's, it's essentially collaborative. You'll never be stronger than your weakest link just can't do it by yourself. It's, it's a team of four people. And if you get it right, you get to, 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 to channel this awesome, awesome music. saying, oh, I'd love to go inside. This is beautiful. We end up playing inside the building. To me, it's just a marvelous thing to be able to make and mold sound and bring it, in, bring it into this world. And this gorgeous file in it, it, it looks beautiful and it can pluck the strings. But until I start to play it, until I start to make something come out of it, it's just a pretty piece of art. And, um, and so to be able to do that is just a really great uh, joy. I guess it's a great honor to be able to do that uh, and do that for a living. We're with each other so much and, you know, you kind of like get fed up with the other person or tired of them and your jokes, their jokes wear on your nerves or their, uh, little things they do uh, all the time, all the time, start to... <laughs> We've often talked about 
you know, the members of the quartet were like brothers. It's like a family. Our families are connected. We all know, you know, the kids all play together, babysit each other, and when we're out of town, the wives get together sometimes and help each other out if there's, if there's a crisis or even just to get together. You know, if I'm in a jam, I, I know who I'm gonna, I'm gonna call. You know, there's, there's that sense of, you know, we're there for each other. I wanted always everything for our string quartet. I wanted a great recording career. I wanted a great touring career. I, I wanted a great academic appointment, you know, where we could really come into contact with great students and be sure that we could pass it along. And I think we've done that. I think we're doing it. It's kind of sacred in the quartet tradition. Want more Truly California? Visit us online to keep up with the local film scene, stream full documentaries, and submit your film to Truly California.
Support for Truly California is provided by the members of KQED.